everybody. Uh, this title's a little long and a little bit misleading. Um, it's all true, but not exactly the point of it. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you about the transcriptomic response of bacillus subtilis that's been adapted to grow at low pressure. So why do we care about low pressure? Um, we care about it for a number of different reasons. People that are concerned with preservation of food are looking at it as a technique. Um, vacuum sealing food, most of you guys are probably aware of that. Air microbiology is another big concern, as you guys are probably aware. The uh, pressure of the atmosphere decreases as you increase uh, in altitude, and microbes actually play a large role in uh, cloud formation and stuff. So they're, they, people are looking at how microbes survive in these upper atmosphere environments. And the reason we're all here today, astrobiology, specifically we're looking at Martian atmospheric uh, conditions. Um, so the atmosphere on Mars, the pressure ranges from 0.1 kilopascal to 1 kilopascal, which is 100-fold less than the 101.3 kilopascals of Earth's sea level air pressure. Um, so we, before we go any further, we want to understand uh, B. subtilis's relationship with uh, low pressure and also talk about uh, bacillus subtilis. So we use bacillus subtilis because it's an extremely well-studied model organism. Uh, behind E. coli, probably the most well-studied organism in the world. It's also very genetically tractable. It's naturally competent, so it has natural mechanisms to take up DNA and incorporate that into its genome. And for the purposes of astrobiology, it's also a spore former. These spores are very common spacecraft contaminants, and they're also extremely resistant to a bunch of extreme environments. Um, so, uh, B. subtilis's relationship with uh, low pressure hypobaria, we found that the low pressure limit for most uh, organisms, including the subtilis, is about 2.5 kilopascals, which is you know 2.5 times higher than the <laughs> highest estimated air pressure on Mars. Uh, we also find that it's growth limiting and non-lethal. There is an exception to this 2.5 kilopascals. There is a genus of bacteria called Carnobacterium that grows at uh, 7 ki or 0.7 kilopascals. And if you're interested in that, you should go to my colleague Kathleen Miller's poster later today. Um, so as we can see in this figure, this kind of explains the relationship of B. subtilis with low pressure. If you grow them at 5 kilopascals or 101.3 kilopascals, you see that at the low pressure, they plateau very early, and they stay that way for a long time. But if you simply repressurize them, just add air back into the container, they start growing immediately. Within So by seven hours, you're back up to normal culture density. So we want to understand Bacillus subtilis's uh, ability to adapt to low pressure, so we did an evolution experiment. We grew Bacillus subtilis at uh, five kilopascals for a thousand generations. Uh, this is about 20 weeks where we change the media every day, um, putting them in a new culture so that they have more nutrients. Um, and what came out the other end was this evolved strain 1106. And it exhibits increased relative fitness to uh, its wild type ancestor 628 at uh, five kilopascals. So we can see this in the relative cell number. So this is again over a, week, a week's worth of growth um, we see that the relative cell counts, the uh, ancestral strain keeps dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping, whereas the evolved strain stays pretty cons consistent. Um, whereas at uh, atmospheric pressure, they're pretty consistent, maybe a slight advantage in 1106, but they're about the same, no real significant difference. So uh, to explain the uh, the evolution experiment a little bit more. Uh, what we found was that over the 20 weeks or so, the optical density of these cultures at 24 hours, where they're you know at the maximum density they're going to be at, uh, it kept increasing over time. So at, as we increase from week to week to week, we see that by the end, the optical density is about 20 or two times higher than the original optical uh, original total optical density of the sample. This is uh, correlated with the accumulation of mutations in, uh, the, in this uh, batch. So this represents the proportion of a given uh, SNP that we found in these cultures. Um, and the most uh, important gene that we're interested in is uh, mutations in this gene RNJB. 
So right away, there are two different mutations that pop up, even, and it's also the first mutation to pop up. Uh, you have a premature stop codon, RNJBC177X, and a small nine base pair in frame deletion, RNJB delta nine. So we want to compare these uh, mutants a little bit to potentially understand them, because they do exchange in the population a little bit. Uh, to do this, instead of having uh, just the normal uh, premature stop codon, we actually constructed a deletion of the uh, RNJB gene by replacing it with a spectinomycin uh, resistance cassette. And we're going to call this strain 1518, and RNJB delta 9 is going to be our evolved strain 1106. So at uh, 5 kilopascals, they both exhibit increased fitness relative to the wild type, which we saw, it, which we can see here for 1518 and on the other slides earlier with uh, 1106. And at 101.3 kilopascals, there's actually a difference between 1518 and 1106 relative to their ancestral wild type uh, strain. So at uh, 101 uh, kilopascals, 1518 exhibits significantly increased uh, fitness relative to the wild type, whereas 1106 had no significant difference. So it tells us that there is a big difference between these strains uh, in terms of what they're actually doing. But uh, they also exhibit no significant difference in fitness uh, relative to each other at either pressure. So it's not exactly clear what the mechanism is here. So before we go any further, we want to understand RNJB a little bit better. It encodes this protein RNase J2. It's an endonuclease, which means it cuts uh, RNA. Um, and it degrades and processes ribosomal and messenger RNA. So it's involved in transcription and protein translation. Um, and it's going to form uh, heterotetramers with the essential RNAs, J1. So that means if you delete this protein, the bacteria is not going to be able to live. Um, and the RNJB delta 9 deletion uh, interrupts this helix 5, which I've highlighted in purple over in the structure. So that might indicate that it, uh, this mutation uh, interferes with RNAs J2's ability to interact with RNAs J1. So to isolate the role of RNAs J2 in this low pressure response, we wanted to look, we wanted to construct strains that were just these mutations. So we have uh, our wild type background, which is just uh, replacing an amylase locus, which isn't going to have any impact in the media we're growing them in, with a chloramphenicol resistance cassette. And then in that same background, uh, 1589 is inserting that RNJB delta 9 mutation. And in 1602, we are just replacing the entire RNJB gene with a spectinomycin resistance cassette. So then we grew them all individually at uh, 5 kilopascals and 101.3 at 27 degrees Celsius, because if you grow them at any higher temperature at 5 kilopascals, the media starts to boil um, until early log phase. We extracted the RNA and sent it off for RNA sequencing. So the files that we get back are going to be FASTQ files. That gives us the sequence and quality scores that indicate the quality of the sequence. So we can do some quality control on that. Then we map them to the genome with a program called Bowtie 2. We do quality control on the mapping with SAMSTAT and then count the transcripts. Uh, well, count the mapped reads. Uh, then we do statistical analyses with R. Uh, we use two different packages, Lima, which is very conservative, and DEC2, which is less conservative, and we can look at the intersection of those two packages to give us a good idea of what genes are being differentially expressed without uh, looking at the biases of one program or another. Then with the differentially expressed genes, we, looked at in, we look at enrichment and functional analysis with uh, two different data databases, David and String. So first we want to look at the impact of the full deletion. Um, at both 5 and 101.3 kilopascals, it differentially expressed over 30% of the transcriptome. So this is having a very large impact on transcription overall. At 5 kilopascals, uh, the, and we're, when we're talking about differentially expressed genes, we're talking about the difference between the mutant that we're looking at and the wild type at its particular pressure, just so we're clear. Um, we found that upregulated genes included antibiotic biosynthesis, integral membrane components, a uh, few positive, positive biofilm regulators, and oxidative phosphorylation genes. Uh, and when I'm talking about antibiotic biosynthesis genes, 
I'm not talking about one or two or three. I'm talking about every antibiotic that Bacillus subtilis is capable of making, which is about seven. And all of those genes are being extremely upregulated. Uh, and then down-regulated genes, we see that ribosome and translation-associated genes, as well as RNA biosynthesis genes, are all down-regulated, which, given the role of RNASJ2, a ribosomal and messenger RNA degrading protein, it's not entirely surprising. So then at uh, atmospheric pressure, 101.3 kilopascals, the upregulated genes, we found very little enrichment in terms of what was functionally going on, despite the fact that the number of differentially expressed genes was very similar. Um, there were a few transcriptional regulators, but even that didn't form any significant pattern. And in the down-regulated genes, we saw the same subset of genes being down-regulated. RNJB delta-9, on the other hand, had a very subtle impact on uh, transcription. At 5 kilopascals, only 27 genes were differentially expressed, including a few cell wall-associated genes that haven't been characterized. A uh, major biofilm component, which is TAS A, but neither of the other uh, neither of the other genes in its operon, so that was a little confusing, and several SP beta prophage genes. Also downregulated were some structural uh, ribosome constituents and purine biosynthesis genes, probably contributing to the same uh, thing that we saw earlier. And at atmospheric pressure, we actually found no significant differences in gene expression, so that's telling that this is. Uh, only happening at five kilopascals. So we want to look at the common uh, genes between the two mutations, because that's going to give us the best idea of what is functionally going on with this low pressure response. Um, we had 14 genes that were being differentially expressed between the two groups, um, and these were all the enosine monophosphate synthesis genes, which is a purine pr uh, precursor, and purines are going to go into RNA um, and DNA. But, uh, and then we also have a bunch of structural ribosome constituents all in the same operon, which is, again, unsurprising. Then we want to look at the common upregulated genes. These are the most likely culprits when we're talking about the low pressure response. And here we had a very short list of five. Um, three uh, transmembrane predicted proteins that have not been characterized, two of which are SP beta prophage genes, and one is totally uncharacterized. Then we have a few other genes, uh, RAPF, which uh, is a regulator of COMA. COMA is the master regulator of uh, components, which is uh, when you're taking DNA in front, uh, into the cell from outside in the environment. And a stress response uh, protein associated, again, with the SP beta prophage. So this tells us uh, a lot and very little at the same time. It tells us that RNASJ2 has a very large role in the regulation of transcription globally, and that the transcriptomic response of this mutation, RNJB delta 9, is very subtle. Um, and fortunately, it gives us a small list of genes to actually examine for future uh, purposes if NASA wanted to fund it, which they don't. So I want to thank all of you guys for coming to my talk. I want to thank the organizers for putting on a great committee. Uh, thank you to my committee, and thank you to my lab members. I could not have done that without literally all of them. So uh, thank you, guys. Does anyone have any questions? Great talk. Oh, great talk. Thank you. Um, newbie question. When you did your calculations off of the relative um, fitness, what metrics did you incorporate? Uh, so what we do is just serial dilutions of these cultures at 24 hours. Um, so, and that, so also important to note uh, when we're looking at all of this data, I started my PhD in 2017 in this lab. So this is all, um, some of you guys know Sam Waters. Uh, this is a lot of her data from her uh, thesis work. Um, but when, when we're talking about uh, the relative cell numbers, we're talking about we take this culture, we serial dilute it, and then we plate it on two different antibiotics. And that gives us, so 1106 has, uh, I think, I want to say spectinomycin, and 628 has chlorophenicol as the resistance marker. So that allows us to tell the difference in population size just by plating it on two different antibiotics. Hi, great talk. Um, I hear ribosome, and I have to like just mm -hmm. say something about it. Uh, 
Can, can you go to the genes that you showed yeah. that they're... Yeah. These guys? Now, I don't know them by gene names, mm -hmm. but I'll be interested to sit down with you and look at them as protein names, because mm -hmm. I know them that way. Because in bacteria, transcription and translation are tightly coupled, yeah. Are tightly coupled. So you might have something happening on the structure of the ribosome mm -hmm. that is, you might not have, but it's good to look and it's easy to look. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I would love to do that if NASA wanted to fund this, but they don't. <laughs>